Greetings, friends. This is Jesse here, um, and uh, coming at you with another um, video or set of videos. This is a part one, which implies that there will be a part two. And um, in these next couple of videos, we're going to be talking about the significance of this uh, blood moon phenomenon that is going to be occurring starting, uh, well, April 14th. Um, which is um, the start of Passover. Um, the things we're going to be discussing is is these four blue moons related to any specific prophetic events in Scripture. Um, how, for the first time in a while, that it seems like the three calendars, at least this year, this year, um, is united. I mean, I mean, like for example, you have Passover on the 14th, which is April 14th, um, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, it seems like this year, it seems like for the first time, the rabbinical Jewish calendar, the true biblical calendar, and our Gregorian calendar are all in unison, which I think is very significant. Um, we're going to be talking about, I mean, it's going to be... A lot of word study. Um, we're going to be talking about the calendar issue to kind of really clarify things here, um, because you know, if any of you know that, you know, last year Passover was on the wrong day. You know, the 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 calendar was um, the rabbinical Jewish calendar that is kept today was off. All right, and um, so we're going to get into that to kind of give more of a clarification of how to determine the first of the year. A lot of people, you know, some people may already know this, others may not, so that's why I'm doing that. And then we're going to go into the significance of the blood moons. And um, a little bit of error that is in with those, like for example, they got the blood moon occurring on Passover next year, but if you really look at the true calendar, it actually occurs during the Feast of Unleavened Bread next year, not Passover, um, and these types of things. We're going to be looking at the intervals between each blood moon, which I think is very significant. Now, to start off, I just want to clarify and say that I do not believe that these four blood moon tetrads are a fulfillment of any end-time prophetic events, if you will. However, I do believe that possibly just because of the uh, of, of what is intermingled in with these blood moons that possibly possibly this could be a signal or a warning of things to come here in the here in the near future that I think we might need to be aware of um, you know so that's basically what we're gonna try and cover all angles I am gonna be quoting some other sources that are more in depth on this topic and I'll provide links um, below um, I you know I, I will say up front that I have studied these sources and with scripture myself and I have seen to be it and it and it has seemed to be very very accurate um, you know in these types of things so um, without further ado I'm going to get my face off of here, and then we're going to go through, you know, uh, the first part of this, which is, you know, the calendar, determining the beginning of the years, and uh, how everything's going to play out in 2014 and 2015 regarding to time and space and these types of things. And then probably in part two, we're going to be just specifically concentrating on the blood moons. Part two will probably not be as long as a video as this one. But I think it, you know, this, these two videos might be a very uh, informative tool, um, and I'll provide all the information so you can go and check these things out for yourselves to uh, basically show that I'm not just making this up. Um, but I think there are some very interesting significances in regard to this phenomenon that's going to be occurring starting Monday and ending um, in the fall of uh, 2015 so um, 
without further ado, here we go. Okay, so in this first part, we're going to be talking about the moon phases. You know, I'm not going to get super in depth, but I'm going to go over some useful information to prove that um, the current Hillel calendar that the rabbis and the Jewish people um, that uh, with the calendar and stuff is not the correct way of doing it and I will prove from their own sources that is the case now however you know a lot of times that yes the um, the calendars will all align like for example this year we have the Passover aligning on the day it should be same thing with the unleavened bread you know and so on and so forth okay but every third or fourth year um, there seems to be an error Number one, you know the you know in this post Talmudic era, uh, you have the rabbis that have a fixed calendar on uh, uh, starting the beginning of the year at Tishri one. Also, by determining the month, they begin the month by the sliver of the new moon. That is inaccurate. That is false. That is not true. Um, the new the the month always begins with the new moon, the dark moon. Okay, and um, so we're going to go over all of that to kind of get a groundwork of part two, which is going to specifically talk about these blood moons that are going to be going on within the next year. Okay. Yes, it is true that these blood moons all occur on feast days. But there is one inaccuracy, and that is in 2015, that blood moon does not occur on that Passover, but it occurs on the first day of unleavened bread. Okay, so we have to um, be able to prove that using scripture to be able to calculate when these times begin. Because, again, scripture says, remember the former things of, go of old, I am God, there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning now when we say beginning we have to go all the way back to Genesis and figure out how everything was determined everything was determined by the sky by the stars by the moon and the Sun the moon is not evil the Sun is not evil it's what man imperfected man has done with it to incorporate Sun worship in regards to timekeeping and moon worship like uh, Islam does but the purpose of the Sun the moon and the stars was to determine times dates years months and that was it it wasn't you know like for example the barley harvest was determined was a earthly um, it was a earth earthly ramification of um, determining the year okay so let's go ahead and get started this is going to be a little bit in depth but not too in depth um, hopefully after I walk you through this you'll have a clear understanding of what's going on here so I'm going to start off by reading Psalm 19 1 through 6 <clears throat> to the chief musician a Psalm of David the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Okay, so the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. This is the main key we need to rely on here. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto, unto night showeth knowledge. Okay, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So basically the stars, the moon, and the sun, they talk to us in a way of determining time. And what easier way we have now, I mean, I, I, I believe by God's appointed, you know, by divine inspiration, that all we have to do is go to a computer <laughs> to figure out when these days are going to happen so we can be in line with the correct biblical calendar not the Hillel the second calendar that is kept currently in Jerusalem today okay 
don't come at me that about this being anti-Semitic. This is not anti-Semitic. I'm giving you scripture. I'm giving you truth. All right. So I just want to clarify that right now. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world, and them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So basically the sun here, when you're looking at this psalm, the sun here is basically de determining the overall time of everything. All right, The sun determines the spring, the vernal equinox, and the fall equinox. There's two divisions of time here, both the spring and the fall. All right, The winter and summer are intercalated in, in with that, but in determining the year, we go by what the equinoxes are. And we're going to be looking at the word circuit to give a more broader definition to prove that this is when a full complete year is um, fulfilled. You know, one thing that we have to understand is God works in a circular fashion, okay, a 360 degree circle. You know, and what happens after you get to that 360 degrees, you have a complete circle. Well, it's you know and, and by understanding that we can understand how determine how we can determine time the way God wants us to determine it Genesis 1 14 and 15 and God said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs okay for seasons for days and years okay so and the key word for seasons there is it means a, a signal a you know an appointed time um, and these types of things uh, festivals and feasts um, and um, the word signs there can also be mean for warnings, for something to alarm you, to say, hey, you know, everything is done in the sky. Everything is done to give us warning, to give us an advanced preparation, basically. And so that is what these greater and lesser lights are for, it's for signs, seasons, and for days and years. This is how we calculate time is by the moon, the sun, and the stars all of them all of them okay like for example every year the sun will go in will be just under <clears throat> the constellation of Pisces in the spring in the fall it, 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 it'll be in the constellation of Aries okay every single year and obviously the constellations are a collection of stars that's another way you can determine the times and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. Okay, so. And obviously Noah had to have known about this, because we read in Genesis 7-11, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of the heavens were open. Well, how did he know that it was the second month, the 17th day of the month? He had to have been going by the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. You know, the sun and the moon. Okay? It's just that simple. Now we're going to totally dissect Psalms 19.6, which is a very key verse in Psalms 19, as I read earlier. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Okay. Now, when we look at the word circuit, it's, very, it's a very unique word 
it's a Hebraic root that word that only occurs four times in Scripture. So I think it'll be inter interesting to look and see what that word circuit means. Okay, the word circuit means tekufa, which means coming round, circuit of time or space, a turning. <clears throat> a circuit, at the circuit as adverb, okay. <clears throat> and also means a revolution, that is of the sun. Course of time, lapse, circuit, come about, and end. So a revolution. A revolution is one complete circle. Okay. That's that also determines the end of the year. Okay, the word end. Now again, we look at the word end, we find the same word to Kufa mentioned in Exodus thirty four twenty two and second chronicles. 2423. Let's go ahead and look at those real quick. Exodus 34:22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of what of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So at the year's end or after the year's end is when the beginning of the year begins and that is when the first fruits, the feast of weeks or first fruits is celebrated. It's after the revolution of the sun, which is at the spring equinox. So that right there in and of itself proves that you can't start the year any time before the spring equinox. It has to be after the spring equinox. Otherwise, the barleys are not going to be ready. The barleys are not going to be aviv, you know, and these types of things. So... <sighs> But here the rabbis, the current rabbis in, in the Jewish calendar has the year starting in the fall, which is totally inaccurate. Okay, it, it, it's, it's not even close to making sense. Not to mention the new moon observance, they observe the new moon by the crescent, which actually has more symbolic meaning of pagan religions than any other. The whole uh, new moon observing, you know, the whole new moon observance uh, of the crescent basically started after uh, the Jewish people came out of captivity from Babylon. Before that, there is no historical record of any of any observing of the new moon being the sliver of the new moon. Okay. Now, if we look at the uh, uh, the Hallelujah Scripture version. It says, uh, we can see where it says, and, and performed a festival of weeks for yourself of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. So again, at the turn of the year, the revolution of the sun, spring equinox, is when the feast of first fruits is celebrated, which is after the spring equinox is passed. And then therefore we determine when the first of the month is, is is to occur after the spring equinox. Three times in a year all your men are to appear before the master, Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Okay. Now again, when is the first of the month? Well, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be unto you the beginning of the month, it shall be the first month of the year to you. That month is known as Nisan, or Abib, or Aviv. <coughs> that is the first of the month. Every single year. It is not the seventh. Never will be the seventh. Never has been the seventh. That was brought on to us by the traditions of men. Post-captivity in Babylon, meaning that once they came out of Babylon is when they incorporated their Babylonian keeping of time into their practices. So what happened? Well, it happened that way because the fact that now the people had to rely on the rabbis to determine when these uh, the, the new year would begin, when the new month would begin, instead of relying on a very simple aspect of keeping time that God has given us we now have turned it into we have to rely on man 
to give us the correct interpretation of when a new year begins and when a new month begins. <clears throat> here we see another version of the word to Kufa here in Second Chronicles 24-23 and it came to pass at the end of the year that the hosts of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them into the king of Damascus so obviously this had to have happened in the spring sometime after the spring or vernal equinox okay <clears throat> so hopefully I was able to clarify that that the word circuit which means a revolution of the Sun a full revolution <clears throat> and how we determine the beginning of the year is the first month after the spring equinox which is month number one according to the biblical calendar all right And again, Psalms 19.6. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And the last time this word is used is in 1 Samuel 1.20. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. So when was Samuel born? I mean, it's... I'm, you know, we, we we can basically figure out birth times and everything all throughout Scripture if we stick to the same simple rule. Well, it seems like Samuel was born after or during the spring, during the spring months that Hannah had conceived and that she bare a son. So chances are maybe Samuel was probably born in the ninth month. <sighs> roughly you know so I mean just by the simple passage in Genesis 1 alone we can unlock a, a lot of keys in regarding to time and dates that are given in scripture and then I can almost guarantee you that history will be able to back it up even from secular historic sources obviously the enemy probably doesn't want you to know that but Needless to say, that's how it is. All right. Now, the word Aviv, which is a very interesting word here. <sighs> it means uh, to be tender. Now, we see in Isaiah 53, it talks about a tender plant. Okay, so that's also another clue that Jesus wasn't born in September and he wasn't born in December but he had to have been born <laughs> sometime in the spring April or May or March you know sometime in that area because that's a very key word there and I'll show that to you in a minute the word uh, Aviv, which means unused root, meaning to be tender, green, that is a young ear of grain, hence the name of the month Abib or Nisan, Abib, ear, green ears of corn. Okay? But the unused root means to be tender. Isn't it interesting when we read in Isaiah 53, 1 and 2, Who hath believed a report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and from child till he shall grow up got growing up to do as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground who is the root and offspring of David it's Jesus Christ he hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him okay but I think that's very interesting that Jesus Christ is considered as, or Yahshua is considered as a tender plant. <laughs> and here, Aviv means tender. So that gives us another clue that, again, Jesus was not born in September or October. But more than likely, he was born at the same time the lambs were to be gathered for the killing of the Passover lamb is when he was actually born 
and how sufficient it is that he was our Passover sacrifice 33 years later. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. <sighs> so clearly from scripture we are to start the year in the spring after the vernal or spring equinox and not in winter before it. Thus the next new moon after the equinox was the beginning month of Aviv. Thus always occurring in the spring. If the twelfth month of the year Adar fell early enough to allow another new moon to occur before the vernal equinox, then it necessitated adding a thirteenth month and waiting until the vernal equinox was observed as the beginning of spring and the new year. This, this addition of an interclary month always kept the first month of the year after the vernal equinox or spring equinox. The spring equinox is the last day of the old year. Okay, so the vernal equinox is the last day of the old year. The year is an astronomical event determined by the sun. It is the point at which the revolution of the earth around the sun comes to complete its cycle. The sun determines the year, and that returning point is the vernal equinox, determining Passover after the beginning of the new year. After, not before. For example, after the vernal equinox, then setting a V first before the vernal equinox would be allowing Passover to be in the new year, but setting a V first or the first uh, first day of the first month before the year ends, i.e., before the circuit of the sun is complete at the vernal equinox or revolution, this is still in the winter of the previous year, which isn't a V. So basically, you would have Passover falling in the winter. which is what happened in the confusing aspect of 2013. Passover was set at the wrong time of the year. The new year was determined at the wrong time. <sighs> that is the reason for intercalary years, i.e. the addition of an extra month so that the first new moon after the year begins after the vernal equinox is of eve. That's the reason why sometimes there is added a thirteenth month. Now, here I'm going to show you what I mean about 2013's Passover. Here we had it occur on March 25th, okay, and ending on the 2nd of April. Now, before I go to the calendar, I'm going to show you a little bit of history here. This is from the Jewish Encyclopedia, and... Uh, I'm just going to read the first um, paragraph here. Um, it says the history of the calendar. The history of the Jewish calendar may be divided into three periods. Okay, three periods of time. The biblical, which is the one we should be keeping now. Okay, the Talmudic, which is basically the one that um, was kept roughly after the time of Yeshua's death and these types of things. And the post-Talmudic, which is basically what we're keeping now under the Hillel the second calendar is what the Jewish people are keeping now, which is, it's, it's an error, it's false. The first rested purely on the observation of the sun and the moon. So even their own sources, even the, the rabbi's own sources, the Jewish Encyclopedia, acknowledges this. The second on observation and reckoning the third entirely on reckoning now here's the thing with observation if you have to observe something to see it even though the new moon you can't physically see but it's still there doesn't that take away the aspect of faith also what about the aspect of uh, we have no continuing city 
The kingdom of heaven, as Jesus says, cometh not with observation. Okay? We have no continuing city. The Jerusalem which is here on this earth was and is in bondage, but the Jerusalem which is above, which is the mother of us all. Can we see that new Jerusalem? So was the aspect of the observation of the new moon waiting for the first sliver? That was an absence of faith. Because we had to have faith in man to tell us when a new month would begin. <sighs> and a third is entirely on reckoning. Basically a fixing of the dates or whatever. A fixed calendar. The study of astronomy was largely due to the need of fixing the dates of the festivals. The command, um, Deuteronomy 16.1, keep the month of Abib, made it necessary to be acquainted with the position of the sun, and the command, also observe the moon and sanctify it, made it necessary to study the phases of the moon. Okay. So, <sighs> and again, Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 states, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The firmament, the moon, the sun, the stars. This is how we're able to tell time. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. <sighs> when you look at the aspect of life, life actually begins in darkness. Okay? From the moment of conception in the mother's womb, your life begins in darkness. Okay? When you look at the aspect of beginning of a beginning of a new of a new month, a new life, it begins in what? Darkness. The new moon, the dark moon. We can't see it through our through our naked eye. We probably could for through through an advanced telescope, but it's there. But we can see the sliver. So that's just another aspect of faith. But again, what happened? Well, we have to wait for the rabbis to tell us when a new month begins or when the new year begins, and therefore we have to go by what they say instead of going by what the Bible says in regards to determining times, days, years, seasons, and these types of things. Not to mention that these sun, you know that 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 uh, the the luminaries, the sun and the moon, and the stars are also for signs, signs in the heavens. Like for example, the blood moons that are coming up, and these types of things. Now, <sighs> again, as I showed you before. This was the Passover according to the fixed Hillel calendar uh, in 2013. They had us falling on March 25th. That was inaccurate because if you look, here is, I'm going to go to March. Okay, so here's March of 2013. All right. What happened? Well, we have a, we had a new moon beginning here. So instead of adding an interclary month, Adar 2, <clears throat> this is when they began the new year. But this is before the spring equinox, which threw everything else off in 2013. And so what happened? Well, 13 days later, they had Passover falling on the 25th, which what they should have done is they should have realized from Scripture that, hey, uh, we have to go by the spring equinox here. Well, that means Passover should have been or was officially at, if you go to April, 
here's a, the spring equinox right here, the 20th, 21st. Okay. If we go to April. This would have been right here. This would have been the beginning of the month right here. This would have been Nissan 1 in 2013. So that means Passover actually occurred what? Well, let's count it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Passover last year was on April 24th. It was not March 23rd. They were about a month off all year long because they started the year too early. They started the year a year too early. This right here, all of this, up to here, was supposed to be the interclary month or the 13th month that is added every three or four years. Now, in a couple more years, we're going to be going through the same problem. They're going to be going by their fixed calendar. And for those that have understanding in Scripture and knowing how to determine the time, we'll be able to get it right. So you ain't going to be able to just put it in Google, when is Passover 2016 or whatever, and think that that's the right day. Because that's what it says on everybody's Gregorian calendar or whatever and these types of things. All right? So... <clears throat> And see, another, uh, you know, another interesting thing is the aspect of the fall equinox. By placing Passover, which is supposed to happen after the spring equinox, after the revolution of the sun, the feast days of the, of the, of the spring months and the fall months will always fall after the equinoxes. Okay? Every single time every single time so like for example we go to 2014 we see September 23rd which is uh, you know the the September equinox of 2014 we go here and obviously we have Yom Teruah which is the blowing of trumpets seventh month the first day of the month on, on the 25th of September it's the same thing as the following year we have it on the 14th of September. You know, so... That way, I mean, it's 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 a very simple matter of timekeeping. Okay. Um, and, uh... Hopefully you're, hopefully you're able to come to some kind of understanding on this. I know it's a very complex issue. But uh, when you really carefully study it out, it's uh, not as hard as it seems to be. Okay. Um, and again, um, I'm, I've, I only went over this topic just to show, um, just as a precursor. So now in part two, we're going to go in depth of what the blood moons are and what days they fall on and these types of things there you know it is correct this year as it's falling on Passover when it's supposed to be Passover is on the correct day however next year the that that blood moon does not occur on Passover but it occurs on the Feast of Unleavened Bread the first day of it okay so and I'll and I'll show that to you how that is the case in the next video God bless